Hi, we're looking at chapter 6, section 2, absolute values, square roots, and quadratic equations. A part of the issue in today's notes is just remembering to do the absolute value step. That's something that I struggled with when I did this in high school. Uh, but I want to start out by talking about absolute value, and then we'll get into how that relates to square roots and the quadratics that we're doing in this chapter. Um, so my room number one is absolute value. And you could write this first part, you could skip this first part, it's really something you've been doing for years. But the whole point in absolute value is you take what's in the parenthesis, or what's in the absolute value, what's in, then I'm going to do my two lines for my absolute value sign, and make it positive. And if you find you're getting stuck on absolute value ones, come back to that. It's real basic, but it works. So for example, Let's say you just have the question absolute value of 8. Well, you take whatever's inside the absolute value and you make it positive. So if it's absolute value of 8, that just stays as a 8. If you have absolute value of negative 8, well, you take what's in the absolute value sign, make it positive. So that also gives you an 8. And now I want to flip over to the graphing. Let's say we want to graph this here. And I have y equals absolute value of 8. Now the common mistake that people make, oh, y equals absolute value of x, y equals absolute value of x. Now the common mistake that I see from people here is that they say, well, when I graph this, I can only be over here on the right side of the equation. That they say, well, x has to be positive. Well, if you look back at the example before, what's inside the absolute value could be positive or it could be negative. Uh, x could be positive, like my absolute value of 8 here. Or x could be negative, like here where I have the negative 8 inside the absolute value. It's the y values that have to be positive. So we could graph this one of a couple different ways. We could take and go through and uh, make a little xy chart that would totally work. Or we could be resourceful, some may call it cheating, but um, take the shortcut and use your graphing calculator. So if you have your graphing calculator handy, go ahead and grab that. And for the graphing calculator, we could have it make the xy chart for us or actually do the graph for us as well. But if you hit your y equals button in the very upper left, we want to type in absolute value of x. Now absolute value is a little bit hard to find, uh, so once you're into your y equals, you can press your math button right over here below the second. And now we don't see absolute value here in this first list, but if you press your right arrow and go over to where number is highlighted, you'll notice that the top thing is this abs for absolute value. So I'm going to press either 1 or enter to select that. And some calculators they'll say ABS parentheses. And you could just put your X in there. This newer operating system, when I hit my variable key, and I'm, you could press enter. I'm just going to press my right arrow to get out of there. But so you'll either have Y1 equals absolute value of X like this, or perhaps it'll show up uh, Y1. Let me grab a pen back. So on your screen, you might be seeing Y1 equals, and then ABS parentheses X. Then you could either press enter because you're at the end of the line, or you could end your parentheses. But if I get back to my graphing calculator, a couple options from here. One would be to go ahead and just graph it. So you could hit your graph button, and it takes all the challenge out of it. That's what our graph over here should look like, a V of some sort. We have a slope being 1 over on the right side, slope being negative 1 on the left side. The other thing you could do is up above your graph button, you have the table. So you could do second and then graph and then fill in your little xy chart. You could go up or down if you wanted more values in one direction or the other. But from there you could actually put it on a nice sheet of graph paper. That would work if you had y equals absolute value of 3x, of 15x, of negative 7x. Um, you could use your graphing calculator for that. But when we have y equals absolute value of x, to draw this in, um, we're going to have, well the slope is going to be a 1 because we just have a 1x inside there. So over here on the left, the slope will be 1. So it should be going up at about a 45 degree angle. And then slope of negative 1 over here in quadrant 2. So it should look something like that. I should throw my arrowheads on because that's going to keep going. But that's what our graph will look like if we're graphing absolute value of x. And a couple ways to get it. Um, moving on to my Roman numeral 2. 
Roman numeral two now, we're looking at square roots. And before I actually tie in the absolute value of the square roots, I want to just kind of uh, mention a point about square roots. So a couple examples, you could copy them, you could not. But if we were to take kind of some simple ones, I'm going to do square root of four. So this is just kind of like an example. You could say example, square root of four. And that, I'm guessing most everybody does in their heads. So well, square root of four is two. And the reason is uh, because two times two equals four or you could say 2 squared is 4. So that's why um, at square root of 4 equals 2. Well, you could also say, well, what about a negative 2? Could square root of 4 equal negative 2? Because negative 2 times negative 2 also equals a positive 4. Or negative 2 squared equals 4. Now, word of caution, on the graphing calculators, if you do this negative 2 squared equals 4, it works right to left. So it actually does 2 squared, gets 4, and then applies the negative. So it'll give you this wrong. We've talked about that in my class several times by now. But if you're going to do a negative number to an even power, you need to put it in parentheses, or I usually just drop the negative when I punch it in the calculator. But um, So is negative 2 an answer? And it is, but what I want to say, and write in the notes of this, I would actually write, when you do that radical sign, so when you have square root of 4, square root of 25, square root of 30, um, that when you have that radical, that always gives the positive answer. So the radical sign always gives the positive answer. So now here's really kind of the rule and this is maybe what I should have starred, or maybe we'll double star it. But this is going to be the thing that is just hard to remember sometimes. I can think back to high school. I took quizzes. Like, I totally aced that thing. Then I'd get it back, and I'd see that I just missed doing this. But if you ever do square root of a variable squared, uh, well, square root and squares undo each other. But what that's going to have to equal, if you have a square root, or really an even root, a fourth root, is that equals the absolute value of x. And here's kind of why, maybe quickly do that. If we were to look at that first example, if I had 2 squared, and I did the absolute, or square root of that, so 2 squared is 4, square root of 4 is 2. So that works. In this case then, where x equals 2, you could say the square root of x squared equals x. Um, but now, if x was a negative 2, when we do that, if we have this negative 2 squared, that also gives us a 4. So now when I do the square root of 4 there, I get a positive 2 again. I always get the positive answer with a radical sign. But now here, when x equals negative 2, the square root of x squared equals the opposite of x, or negative x. So don't let that negative there mesh up, but that's kind of the point. I'll get rid of those just for lack of, so I don't confuse people more. But it doesn't matter really what our variable starts as. If we do the square root of that variable squared, we're going to get the positive number answer, like in this case. And so I'm going to jump ahead then and look at some calculations. And this is really going to be where that comes into play. And like I said, a lot of the issue is just remembering to do it. So my first example here. I have x squared equals 196. Uh, so kind of starting with the easier one right out of the gate. Um, so x squared equals 196. Well, if I want to get rid of the squared, I do square root. So I'm going to square root the left side. If I do that, I need to square root the right side as well. I uh, keep it equal. Now, the square root of 196, that should give me 14 if I punch that in my calculator, so 14. Now we can't just say the answer is 14, because if you go back to what I had on that last slide, whenever you have the square root of a variable squared, whenever that squared is inside the square root, now we need to over here say so that's absolute value of x. So in other words, when we had our original problem, and we said x squared equals 196, well it could have been 14 squared is 196, but like in our earlier example, x could also have been negative 14. So whenever you get something like this, now you need to break it up into two answers. X could be 14. So if you put a 14 right there, absolute value of 14 gives you 14. Or the other possibility 
is x could have been a negative 14. Because if I were to take and rewrite this here as absolute value of negative 14, that also gives me the positive 14. So that's why when you have absolute value of x, you need to write it as both, both answers. So that's one example. And like I said, the hard part, I think once you kind of get past the newness of it, the hard part is just remembering to do it. Um, another example, I'm going to try to muddy the waters a little bit. Um, three parentheses x plus four parentheses quantity squared equals 363. So with this, really it's kind of going to end up these same steps here. We just need to do some more steps before we get to that point. So solving for a variable, we always do order of operations backwards. So we say, well, what can we move away from this x value uh, by adding and subtracting? And it might be tempting to move the 4, but that's locked inside the parentheses, so we can't do that first. So if I would say, all right, here's my order of operations. We're going that direction. There's nothing adding or subtracting that we can mess with right now. So multiplying and dividing, we have this 3 times. So we undo multiplying by 3, the inverse of multiplication is division, so we divide by 3, and that'll drop out, leaving me with uh, x plus 4, quantity squared, equals 121. Now we still can't mess around inside the parentheses, I should go back to here. So we did our multiplying and dividing, nothing's else connected with by multiplication and division. So then we next look at exponents. And this step here is going to be where we get rid of the squared then. So the inverse of squaring is to do square root. And now we have on the right side an 11. The square root of 121 is 11. Now over here on the left side, we have the square root of something with a variable squared. So now it's kind of like my x is really x plus 4. But we have something with a variable squared, and we did square root to it. So now here is where we need to put in our absolute value. So we have x plus 4 all inside the absolute value equals 11. So now what that tells us is inside here, this could have been 11, because absolute value of 11 would give me my 11. So one possibility is x plus 4 could equal 11. Or another possibility would be we could inside the absolute value here have negative 11. Absolute value of negative 11, absolute value of negative 11 gives me positive 11. So x plus 4 could have been negative 11. And if you get that, now you're really past the tough math part. You just have to go through and solve two simple equations like you've been doing for years, starting back in, I don't know if you do it in pre-algebra, at least in algebra. Um, but we get x by itself by getting rid of the adding 4. So we subtract 4 from both sides in both of these problems. So then I get an x could be 7, so x is 7. Or over here on the right, I have x equals negative 15. So going back to my original problem here, um, I could have put a 7 in here for x. If I punch all that in my calculator, I get 363. Or I could have put a negative 15 in here for x. So it would give me my negative 11 squared times 3 would also give me 363. So these two here are going to be my two possible answers for example 2 couple more examples, and then we're getting close to the end. Uh, so my example three is going to be solve for r. And this I'm really just stealing from the book. It's example number three. But they say something like uh, a, the area of a circle, is 100. So we'll say area of a circle, a equals pi r squared. If this equals 100, we could go through and solve this thing. So I'm going to kind of get rid of my a here and just say, well, pi r squared is 100. So first step is going to be to, well, what's connected by addition and subtraction? Nothing. So we don't worry about that. Uh, next step, what's connected by multiplication and division? And that's the pi, so we could divide by pi. And that leaves me with my r squared equals 100 over pi. Now my next step is going to be to square root both sides. And you could do 100 divided by pi in your calculator right there and get some decimal then make sure you do square root of your answer eventually. Um, but now I end up with absolute value of r equals, and eh, I won't punch it, I'm just going to go off my notes. So if you would punch that in your calculator, this here would, inside the radical, comes out to be about 31.83. Uh, it should keep going, so if you do square root of that, then 
including all the other decimals, you're going to get something real close to 5.64. So now what that tells us is inside my absolute value, R could be 5.64, or your other possible answer would be R equals negative 5.64. And a lot of times, once people start getting the hang of this, they just kind of start flying through questions. They're like, well, who? I did it right. I'm done. Move on. But if you go back to what the problem was actually asking, it was saying, well, the area of a circle is 100. So now when you talk about your domain, well, what's the domain of your R values? What possible radii could you have for circles? You can't have a circle with a negative radius. So even though mathematically, we could get two different numbers for the radius of a circle. Logically, only one's going to make sense. The radius has to be 5.64. You can't draw a circle with a negative radius. That's really pretty much the end of the notes. Um, just to make the homework easier for our book, I want to make a comment about rational and irrational numbers. That's another thing we did in Chapter 1 in addition to the uh, domain and range stuff. So rational numbers, those are going to be numbers that could be written as a fraction. Um, so rational numbers... Uh, they can be written as a fraction, so can be written as a fraction. So what does that mean in like real person language? It's going to be a couple different kinds of numbers. One, it's going to be, maybe we'll say integers. If you have something like a 4, well a 4 is just 4 over 1, a million million over one. No. So it's going to include integers. It's going to include uh, decimals. That the math word is terminate. I'm just going to say stop. Um, so if you have like 0.23, that's the same as 23 over 100. If your decimal was seven digits long, then it'd be whatever those seven digits would be over a one with seven zeros. Um, so decimals that stop, all those can be written as a fraction. Or repeat. And the most common one for that is going to be uh, like 0.3 repeating. is what a lot of people will think of. Because 0.3 repeating is one third. So rational numbers, going back to chapter one, uh, anything without a decimal or decimals that stop, terminate, uh, or repeat. Irrational numbers are numbers that can't be written. So can't be written as a fraction. And then that's going to be the numbers that don't fit the definition for a rational. Uh, so that's going to be decimals that don't stop or repeat. So decimals that don't stop or repeat. And in thinking about those, probably the most common example at this point in your math career is going to be pi. Pi, they're still working on finding more digits of it. I think they're out to like over a million digits of pi. Um, but they haven't found a pattern. It doesn't repeat at anything that they found so far. So pi, square root of 2 would be another one. So uh, some radicals that don't work out well. That's all there is in Section 2.